Welcome to my Ultimate React Native course. I'm Mosh, and I'm going to be your instructor. In this course, you're going to learn how to build fast and beautiful mobile apps using React Native. I'm assuming in this course, you know nothing about React Native and want to learn everything from scratch. I will explain every line of code I write so you learn and understand all the underlying principles. Now, we're not going to work on a dummy to do app or a calculator. We're going to work on a real full fledged app called Done With It. This app is a marketplace for selling the stuff you don't need anymore anything you're done with. Here's the front screen of our app. We can log in or register. Let's log in with my account. Here we can see all the items that people are selling. For example, we have this guy over here. He's selling his red jacket for $100. Of course, this is all dummy data that I have generated. Now we can tap an item to see more details about it. We can see who the seller is. We can see where the item is located on the map. We can also send a message to the seller. And this will send a push notification to the target mobile device. Now we can pull this down to close it. We can also pull down the list to refresh it, just like the apps you use on a daily basis. We can filter the list and look at the cameras that are for sale. We can add a new listing. First, we select an image. We can add a second image, up to three images. Now let's give it a title, my first item. We give it a price, $99. Now let's assign it to a category. So let's put it in the category of furniture. Now, when I post this to the server, you're going to see a progress bar and a beautiful animation at the end. Take a look. There you go, and done. Here are the listings I have posted. We also have my account page, where we can access my listings and the messages I have received. Now we can swipe an item to the left to delete it, just like the apps you use on a daily basis. So if you follow along, by the end of this course, you're gonna master React Native and you'll be able to build mobile apps with confidence. So are you excited to build this app with me? Then let's jump in and get started. To take this course, you don't need any familiarity with React Native or mobile development in general. But you need to know JavaScript and React because React Native is built on top of React, but instead of targeting the browser, it targets mobile platforms. You don't need to be a React expert, but you need to know all the essential concepts such as components, JSX, props, state, and so on. If you wanna learn React, I have a two hour tutorial on my YouTube channel, as well as a complete 13 hour course that teaches you everything from the basics to more advanced concepts. I've put the links down below if you're interested. So what is React Native and is it the right tool for you or not? Well, React Native is a framework for building native apps for iOS and Android using JavaScript. So if you know JavaScript, you can use your JavaScript skills to build real native apps for iOS and Android. These apps are truly native, so they are not web apps that look like a mobile app. So with React Native, you don't need to know iOS or Android programming unless you want to build a really complex app and you need to talk directly with the native API of these platforms. For the most part, you don't need to do that. So you can write pretty much all of your application code in JavaScript and share it across iOS and Android. That's why a lot of companies these days prefer to build their apps using React Native because they don't need to hire two separate teams of developers maintaining two different code bases. One for iOS written in Swift or Objective-C and the other for Android in Java or Kotlin. Now, one of the common misconceptions about React Native is that you cannot use it to build any serious apps. For example, we have this guy over here. His name is John Smith. He's a developer with a lot of strong opinions. He believes that the only way to build anything serious is by using the native languages and tools. Well, that's not true. Here are five apps that are built with React Native. Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Skype, Uber Eats, and many, many more. So if you have an idea that you want to turn into a real app using your JavaScript skills, React Native is the best tool to have in your toolbox. There are two ways to build React Native apps. We can use plain React Native or Expo. Expo is a set of tools and a framework that sits on top of React Native and hides a lot of complexity from us. It makes it incredibly fast and easy to build React Native apps. If you have never done mobile development before, Expo is the way to go. You can build and run your first app within a few minutes. 
The other option is to use React Native CLI or Command Line Interface. When we create a project with React Native CLI, our project will look like this. So we have these folders, Android and iOS. These are native Android and iOS projects. We also have our JavaScript code on the site that can be shared across these two platforms. So this approach is suitable for people who have some experience with iOS or Android programming. In this course, I'm assuming you don't have any prior experience in mobile development, so we're going to use Expo. When we create a project with Expo, we're not going to have these Android and iOS sub-projects. We only have JavaScript code. So that means we cannot work directly with the native API of these platforms. We are limited to what Expo gives us in terms of the native features. Now, honestly, this is not a problem for a lot of apps because Expo gives us a lot of native features. So we can build a real complete app using just Expo. And that's what I'm going to show you in this course. But if you do have some experience with mobile development and you want to have some extra flexibility, if you want to customize or tweak some native components, you can always eject from Expo and get access to the underlying iOS and Android projects. I will show you how to do that later in this course. So next I'm going to show you how to set up your development environment. All right, the first thing I want you to do is to make sure that you're running Node version 12 or higher. So here in the terminal window, let's run Node-V. I'm running Node version 12.14.1. Make sure you are running Node version 12 or higher. Now let's install Expo CLI globally. So NPM, if you're on a Mac and you haven't configured permissions properly, you have to prefix this with sudo. So npm install dash g expo dash CLI. This is going to take a while, so I'm going to pause the recording. All right, expo CLI is installed. You might get some warnings. Don't worry about them. They don't really matter. So with Expo CLI, we can easily create and run a React Native project. Now, you should also install Expo Client on your phone. This is an app that you should download from the App Store. It's available for both iOS and Android. With this, we can easily run our app on a physical device. Now, as my code editor, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code or VS Code. You can use any code editor that you prefer, but it's easier if you download VS Code and code along with me because Throughout the course, I'm going to show you a lot of tips and tricks, a lot of shortcuts to write code fast. You're going to love these tips. So you can download VS Code from code.visualstudio.com. Now here in VS Code, we're going to use a bunch of extensions. These extensions are optional, but they make our job easier. Let me show you. So over here, let's search for React Native. The first extension we're going to use is React Native Tools. This is built by Microsoft. And with this, we can debug our React Native applications inside VS Code. It's very popular. The second extension we're going to use is React Native slash React slash Redux snippets. This gives us a bunch of code snippets, so we can type a few shortcuts and generate code really fast. I love this extension. I also use Prettier for formatting my code. So let's search for Prettier. There you go. Prettier Code Formatter made by S. Van Peterson. It's a very popular extension. You probably have it yourself. I also use Material Icon Theme. Let's take a look. With this extension installed, we get pretty icons in our project. So the files in our project are going to get icons like these depending on their type. Now let's apply a setting. So the moment we save our changes, our code gets reformatted. So on the top, we go to Preferences and then Settings. Search for Format on Save. So make sure to enable this option. So anytime you press Control and S or Command and S, VS Code will use Prettier to format your code. Now that we have set up our development environment, let's create our first Expo project. So here in the terminal window, let's type Expo in it. Done with it. That's the name of the app we're going to build. You can call it anything you want. So let's go with this. Now we have to choose a workflow for building this app. We can use one of the managed workflows or one of the bare workflows. If we use a managed workflow, Expo is going to take care of all the complexity behind the scene. So with a managed workflow, we're not going to see those iOS and Android projects. We only have a pure JavaScript project. If we use a bare workflow, 
we're going to have a bare bone React Native project. So we'll have those iOS and Android projects. In this course, I'm going to go with this blank template. We also have a template with TypeScript, but I'm not going to use that in this course because I don't want to bring extra complexity. So let's use the blank Manage Workflow template. Now, this is going to take a while, so I'm going to pause the recording. All right, our project is ready. So let's go into this folder and then open it in VS Code. Before we run this app, let me give you a quick overview of what we have in this project. So we have this assets folder. This is where we put all the images, audio files, videos, and so on. Any kind of asset that we want to bundle with our app. Now we also have app.js. This is a basic React Native component. So on the top, we are importing React. We're also importing a couple of components from React Native. So this view that we have here is like a div in the web world, and text is used to display text on the screen. So in React Native, we don't have HTML elements like div, paragraph, anchor, and so on. We have to use the building blocks or the components that are provided by React Native. Here is an example. This app is a function component. So by default, React Native uses function components because they are simpler, they're more lightweight. You can use class components, but it's better to use function components. So here we're returning a JSX expression. We have a view, which is like a div. This view has some style. We'll look at that later. And inside this view, we have this text component for displaying this text on the screen. Now, what is the style here? Well, we're referencing this object, styles.container. We're creating the styles object over here using the style sheet object. So we call the create method and pass it an object. This object has a property called container that contains all the styles for our container. Now, if you look at the name of these styles, they look familiar. For example, we have background color. This is like a CSS attribute, but this is not CSS. This is just a plain JavaScript property. When we compile our app, React Native is going to translate these properties and the components we're using to their native widgets. For example, this view over here, if we build this app for iOS, this view is going to be mapped to UI view. If we build it for Android, it's going to be mapped to Android view. So with these components, we can represent our UI in an abstract or platform independent way. When we compile our app, React Native is going to map these components into their native widgets. So that's why the apps that we build with React Native are real native apps. Now we should open a terminal window to start Expo Server to serve our app. So on the top, we go to the View menu. Look at the shortcut for the terminal window. On Mac, it's Control and Backtick. So let's open up the terminal window. Here we type npm start. Now this opens our browser pointing to this address. The port number might be different on your machine depending on what you're running. So this is what we call Metro Bundler. It's the JavaScript bundler for React Native. So it's responsible for compiling all of our JavaScript files into a single file. Now here on the left, we have a few commands. We can run our app on an Android device or emulator. We can run it on an iOS simulator. We can run it in a web browser. We can send a link to our app with email so other people can try it. We can also publish our app to Expo. So anyone in the world can view our app using Expo Client. This is much faster and easier than going through app stores. If you have done any kind of mobile development before, you know that going through app stores is very tedious. There are so many steps you have to follow. With Expo, we don't have to worry about this. We can simply publish our app to Expo and anyone in the world can easily view our app. Of course, this is purely for development and testing, not for production. We'll talk about that later in the section. So this is Metro Bundler. Now, if you go back to the terminal window in VS Code, you can see these commands and their shortcut. These are the same commands that you saw in Metro Bundler. For example, we can press A to run our app on an Android emulator or I to run it on an iOS simulator. And this is where the logs for our app will appear. So if anything goes wrong, this is the first place we want to look at. All the errors and log messages will appear here. So we want to have this terminal window open at all times. All right, now that Metro Bundler is running, next I'm going to show you how to run our app on an iOS simulator. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to run our app on an iOS simulator. To do this, you need a Mac. If you don't have a Mac, don't worry. You can still run the app on your phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone. You can also run the app on an Android virtual device, which I'm going to show you in the next lesson. Now, 
I want you to install Xcode. You can get it from the App Store. So open our App Store and search for Xcode. Here you can get the latest version. Xcode is a large app, so installing it is going to take a while, perhaps 20 to 30 minutes, depending on your internet connection. Once you install Xcode, run it, and then go to Xcode Preferences. On this window, go to the Locations panel and make sure you have installed the latest command line tools. Now we can start an iOS simulator. So let's close this window. We go to Xcode, Open Developer Tool, Simulator. So here's our iPhone simulator. We can move it around. We can resize it. We can change the type of this device by going to File, Open Device. Under iOS, you can see various iOS devices. For example, we can start an iPhone 8. This is going to start a second simulator. Now, unfortunately, at the time of recording this video, Expo gets confused when you have multiple iOS simulators running. So I'm going to close this iPhone 8. I'm going to use this iPhone 11. Now we go to Metro Bundler and run our app on the iOS simulator. We can also run it in VS Code by pressing I in the terminal window. So this is going to start our project in iOS simulator. The first time you're going to see this message popping up, open in Expo. So let's open it. So this is the Expo client that you install on your phone. Let's close the welcome message. And here's the output of our app. We have this text in the center of the screen. Now let me show you something really cool. I'm going to put this on the side and open our project on the left side. Now let's change the text here to hello world. Now the moment I save the changes, our app is going to refresh. Take a look. Save. And here's the hello world message. This is one of the powerful features of React Native called Fast Refresh. So we can see our changes as soon as we save. We don't have to wait for native builds to finish. Now, in this iOS simulator, we can bring up the developer menu by pressing Command and D. Now, unfortunately, this does not work on my machine anymore. I think this happened after I upgraded my Xcode. So I figured out to make this work, I have to press Control D first and then Command D. So this is the developer menu I was talking about. This is part of Expo Client. So here we can reload our app. So in case something goes wrong and fast refresh doesn't work, we can manually trigger a reload. We can also copy the link to clipboard. We can go to home. So here we can see other Expo projects we are working on. At the moment, we have a single project and it's here. So let's get back to it. So you can bring up the developer menu by pressing Control and D and then Command and D like this. So this is all about the iOS simulator. Next, I'm going to show you how to run this app on an Android virtual device. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to set up an Android virtual device to run your apps. Now, while you can always run your React Native apps on your phone, during development, it's a lot easier to run it on a simulator or a virtual device because you don't have to constantly touch your phone. So to set up an Android virtual device, First, you need to install Android Studio. You can get it from developer.android.com slash studio. So go ahead and download the latest version of Android Studio. The first time you run Android Studio, you're going to see a setup wizard like this. So click on Next. Go with the standard installation because this is going to install all the necessary components you need to create an Android virtual device. So click on Next. Here you can select a light or a dark theme we don't really care about this because we are not going to develop in Android Studio. So let's click on Next. Now look at the components that are going to get downloaded. We have Android Emulator, Android SDK Build Tools, Android SDK Platform, Android SDK Platform Tools, Intel x86 Emulator Accelerator, as well as a bunch of other components. These are the components you need to create an Android virtual device. If these components are not listed here, don't worry, I'm going to show you how to install them later. But if you go with the standard installation, you shouldn't have any problems. So let's click on Finish. This is going to take a while, so I'm going to pause the recording. All right, Android Studio is ready. Now let's go to the Configure menu and select SDK Manager. If you follow the standard installation, here you should have all those necessary components. So on the SDK Platforms tab, you should have the latest stable version of Android. At the time of recording this video, that is Android 10 or Q. Under SDK Tools, you should have Android SDK Build Tools. 
as well as Android Emulator, Android SDK Platform Tools, and Intel Emulator Accelerator. If these components are not selected, select them, click OK, and then Android Studio is going to install them for you. Now, if you're on a Mac or Linux, there is an extra step you need to follow. If you're a Windows user, you don't have to follow this step, but please watch the rest of this video because there are more steps you need to follow. So head over to docs.expo.io. Now on the left, under Manage Workflow, you can find all the official instructions to install an Android virtual device. So we have almost finished the first step, so we installed Android Studio. Now down the bottom of the first step, you can find the extra step for Mac and Linux users. So you need to add Android SDK to your path. So you should edit your Bash profile or Bash RC and add this export statement. So let's copy this export statement. Now open a terminal window and use your favorite editor to edit your Bash profile. So I use Visual Studio Code. Now we go to our home directory and open Bash underline profile. So here's my Bash profile. At the end of Bash profile, I'm going to paste what I copied from the official documentations of Expo. So we're exporting Android SDK, and here's the path to Android SDK. But you need to replace this path with the path of Android SDK on your machine. How do we get it? Very easy. Back to Android Studio. Let's go to Configure SDK Manager. Here we can find the path to Android SDK. So copy this. Now back to your favorite editor. Let's replace the path with what we copied. Now here in Expo Documentation, if you're on Mac, there is one extra step you need to follow. You need to add platform tools to your path as well. So copy this second export statement and paste it at the end of your Bash profile. Now, once again, we need to replace the path to Android SDK. So let's delete this and use what we have over here. So here's the complete path, library, Android SDK, platform tools, okay? Save the changes. Now, on my machine, I'm using ZSH or Z Shell. This is the fancy terminal window I have here. For this, I need to edit a second file that is in the home directory, that is ZSHRC. Now, back to Bash Profile, I'm going to copy these two export statements and paste them into ZSHRC. So, copy and paste them over here. Save the changes. Now, back in the terminal window, at this point, we should be able to run ADB. If you get an error saying command not found, that means you didn't follow one of these steps properly. All right, we're done with the instructions for Mac and Linux users. So everyone should follow the rest of this video to set up an Android virtual device. So here on Android Studio, let's go to configure AVD Manager. AVD is short for Android Virtual Device. On this screen, let's click Create Virtual Device. Here we should select the hardware we want to emulate. We have so many options. We have various pixel devices. We have Nexus and so on. If you don't know where to start, usually the latest pixel device is a good place to start. I prefer to use the one with Play Store installed. So I'm going to go with Pixel 3a. You can see the size, resolution, and density of this device. So let's click on Next. Now here we should select the image or the operating system we want to install on this device. You can select any of the images here in the recommended tab. I prefer to use the latest stable version. That is often the second item here. So let's go with this. Now Android Studio is downloading this image to install on our emulated hardware. It's going to take a while, so I'm going to pause the recording. All right, we're done with this step, so let's click on Next. Now here we can give this device a name. I'm going to use the default that specifies the type of hardware and the image we have installed on it. Now, let's click on Finish. All right, our virtual device is ready. We can run it by clicking on this Play button here. So here's our virtual device or emulator. We can simply drag the sides and resize it. So I'm going to make it smaller and put it on the side. Now to run our app in our new Android virtual device, we go back to Metro Bundler and on the left select Run on Android Device or Emulator. We can also go to our terminal window 
and press A to run this app in our Android emulator. But make sure that the emulator is up and running before you press A. Now over here, you can see that Xbox client was installed on the device. So now Metro Bundler is building our JavaScript bundler. So here's Expo client. And as you see, it's downloading our JavaScript bundle. And here's our React Native app. Now here we have Hello World because in the previous lesson, I changed this message. If you skipped the previous lesson, let me show you something really cool. So I put VS Code on the left side. And now let's change this message to Hello React Native. Now, the moment I save this change, our app is going to get refreshed immediately. Take a look. So save, and here's Hello React Native. This is the beauty of React Native. So we see our changes the moment we save them. We don't have to wait for native builds to finish. So this makes development incredibly fast and easy. Now, on this virtual device, we can bring up the developer menu by pressing Command and M on Mac or Control and M on Windows. So here's the developer menu. We can manually reload the app in case the automatic reload didn't work. We can copy the link to clipboard. We can go to home. Here you can see the list of projects you're working on. Currently, we have only a single project that is done with it, which is hosted at this address, Expo. Here's the IP address of my machine, and here's the port number. Now we can select it and go back to our app. Once again, you can bring up the developer menu by pressing Command and M on Mac or Control and M on Windows. Here we have a few other items. These are used for debugging. We'll talk about them later in this section. Next, I'm gonna show you how to run this app on a real physical device. As I told you before, during development, it's a lot easier to test your app in a virtual device or a simulator because you don't have to constantly touch your phone. However, simulators are, well, simulators. They don't always function like a real device. Also, certain features are not available in the simulators. So you want to test your app on a real physical device, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone. So the first step is to install Expo Client on your phone. You can get this from the App Store. Once you install this, to run your app on your phone, all you have to do is to go to Metro Bundler and look at this QR code. So point your phone at this QR code and open the camera app. Your phone is going to pick this up and run your app in Expo. As simple as that. Just make sure your phone is connected to the same wireless network as your computer. Otherwise, this is not going to work. Now, when you're running your app on a real physical device, you can bring up the developer menu by simply shaking your device. So when you shake your device, you're going to see something like this. This is what we call the developer menu. Over the next few videos, I'm going to show you a few tools and techniques to debug your React Native applications. We have a few different tools here. You can choose the tool or the tools that you prefer. And it really depends on what you want to do. So the simplest way to debug our React Native applications is using the good old console.log statements. So here in App Component, we can do a console.log and say app executed. Now save the changes. Bring up the embedded terminal. We have two entries for app executed because I have two virtual devices connected to Metro Bundler. I have an iOS simulator and an Android virtual device. And here in Metro Bundler, on the top left, you can see the connected devices. So I've connected an iPhone 11 Pro Max and an Android virtual device. Now we can click on any of these devices and see the log for that device. So console.log is the simplest way to debug our React Native apps. However, these console.log statements can have a negative impact on the performance of our apps in production. So use this only during development and testing. Once you're done with your debugging sessions, make sure to remove them before building your application for production. Next, I'm going to show you how to debug your apps in Chrome. Let's see how we can debug this app in Chrome. So I'm going to create a bug in this app component. Let's declare a variable called x. And without initializing it, let's call x the to string. Now save the changes. We get this red box where we can find information about the error that just occurred. So here's the error message. Undefined is not an object. Evaluating x to two string. And here you can see where in our component tree this error occurred. In this case, it occurred in app component. Now, to debug this app, first we need to dismiss the screen. So we press the escape button. It's gone. 
Now we need to bring up the developer menu. I explained how to do this in the previous lessons. If you're using a real device, you have to shake it. If you're using an Android virtual device, you have to press Command and M on Mac or Control and M on Windows. And if you're using an iOS simulator, you have to press Command and D. On my machine, that doesn't work. So I have to press Control and D and then Command and D. Now we need to enable remote debugging. When we do this, the JavaScript code for this app will end up executing in Chrome. Let me show you. So we tap on debug remote.js. This opens up a new tab in Chrome pointing to this address, localhost slash debugger dash UI. So now the JavaScript for this app will execute remotely in Chrome, and that's going to slow down our app. So when you're done with your debugging session, make sure to stop remote debugging. Now, let's open up Chrome Developer Tools. Here on the console tab, you can see the message that we logged, as well as the error that occurred. Cannot read property to string of undefined. Now, to debug this app, we go to the Sources tab. Over here, click on this icon, Pause on Exceptions, and then select Pause on Caught Exceptions. When we enable this option, if an exception is caught in our app, Chrome is going to stop the execution and highlight the line where the exception occurred. Let me show you. So back to our app, let's bring up the Developer menu and reload our app. Now we can see the line where the exception occurred x the to string. So Chrome paused on this exception. Now let me show you a few tools that we have here for debugging. We can click on any line to insert a breakpoint. And when you reload our app, Chrome is going to stop execution right on that line. So from that point, we can execute our code line by line. We can watch the value of various variables to see if our computations are correct or not. So let's reload our app one more time. So bring up the developer menu. We also have a shortcut for it on Mac. We can press Command and R on an iOS simulator. So reload. Now, line 5 is highlighted and it's about to get executed. Over here, we have various tools for executing our code. So we can step over this line or we can step into it. This is useful if in this line we are calling a function that we have written. So we can step into that function and execute the code in that function line by line. We also have step out. So if you step into a function and we're done debugging that function, we can step out of that function. Now, in this case, console.log is not a function we have written. So it doesn't matter if we step over it or step into it. So I'm going to step over it. And by the way, look at the shortcut here in the tooltip. On Windows, it's F10. On Mac, it's command and a single quote. So when debugging, always use these shortcuts because it's much faster than constantly clicking on these icons. So step over this. Now we are on this line, and you can see that x is undefined. That is the reason why we got this exception. Now here we also have this watch window where we can watch the value of various variables. So click on this plus sign and type x and then enter. So as you can see, x is undefined. So this watch window is really useful to see what's going on. Now we're done with our debugging. We know why we got this exception. So we should remove this breakpoint. Otherwise, next time we reload our app, Chrome is going to pause execution on this line. So let's go back to our code. Delete these two lines, save the changes, then reload our app. Okay, the error is gone. So we should stop remote debugging. Otherwise, our app is going to be really slow. So once again, bring up the developer menu and stop remote debugging. So this is how we can debug our apps in Chrome. Now here we also have the network tab. This is useful when we have API calls to our backend. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to get back to it in the future. Now, what about the elements tab? Well, the elements that you see here are not the elements or the components of your app. These are the elements of the debugger window. So unlike a web app, we cannot select an element and look at its properties. So this is all about debugging in Chrome. We can also debug our React Native apps in VS Code. Let me show you. First, we bring up the Developer menu and enable Remote Debugging. So this opens this window in Chrome. We have to close it, otherwise we'll get an error. But in this case, in this demo, I'm not going to close this window because I want to show you that error. Now, back to VS Code. Let's go to the Extensions panel, search for React Native, 
and make sure you have installed this extension, React Native Tools. With this extension, we can debug React Native apps in VS Code. Now, let's go to the debug panel. The first time we have to create this file, launch.json, this is where we store our debug configurations. Currently, we don't have this file in our project, so VS Code is suggesting to create it. So click on this link. Now, from this drop down list, select React Native. Now, sometimes VS Code doesn't show you this drop down list. I'm not sure why, but it immediately creates the launch.json file. If this happens to you, don't worry, just continue watching. You'll figure out what to do in a second. So we select React Native. Now here we see various configurations for debugging React Native apps. These configurations are installed by that extension, React Native Tools. So if you don't install that extension, you're not going to see these configurations. Now, by default, debug Android is selected. I'm going to deselect this and select Attach to Packager. Honestly, this is the only configuration I'm familiar with. So we select Attach to Packager and click OK. And here's launch.json. So sometimes VS Code doesn't show you that dropdown list. Instead, it immediately creates this file. Now here we have various debug configurations. Currently in our configurations array, we have a single object, a single configuration. And the name of this configuration is attached to packager. If you don't have this object here, you can always add a configuration. You can either click on this button, add configuration, or you can go to the run menu and select add configuration. Now in this context menu, we search for React Native, and this brings up various configurations for debugging React Native apps. So here we have attached to Packager. We also have debug Android and so on. So for example, let's select a second configuration like debug Android. So now we have a second object, a second configuration called debug Android. Now save the changes. We're done with this file. Now in case you're curious, this file is located inside this folder, .vs code. Now, let's go to app.js. I'm going to declare a variable, x and set it to 1. We're going to use this during our debugging session. Now we can insert a breakpoint on this line and start our app in debug mode and execute it line by line, exactly the way we debugged our app in Chrome. Now let's go to the debug panel. In this drop down list, we can see various debug configurations. Currently, we have two configurations debug Android and attach to packager. I'm going to select attach to packager and click on this play button. Our debugger started and then it immediately stopped. To see why this happened, we go to the view menu and then look at debug console. So here's the error cannot attach to packager. Are you sure there is a packager and it is running in this port 8081? So by default, VS Code tries to connect to this packager, React Native Packager, to get the JavaScript code on this port, 8081. We have to change this port to this port over here, 19001. So back to VS Code. On the top, we go to the Code menu, then Preferences, Settings. Now under User tab, here we search for react-native.packager.port. So look, here's the port 8081. We have to change this to 19001. Now we're done with this. Let's bring up the debug panel one more time and start our app in debug mode. Our debugger failed one more time. So let's go to view, debug console. Here's the second error could not debug, another debugger is already connected to Packager. This happened because we have this window open in the background. So sometimes you have a million tabs or windows open. You don't know that you have this window open somewhere. That's why nothing works on your machine. So make sure to find this window and close it because you can either debug in Chrome or VS Code at a single point in time, not both these processes. So now we're going to debug in VS Code, which means our JavaScript code it's going to get executed inside VS Code. So let's bring up the debug panel one more time and start our app. All right, we established a connection. Beautiful. So here's our simulator. Now let's bring up the developer menu and reload the app. 
So the debugger loaded. Now let me close the debug console. Take a look. We are in app.js, and the first line where I inserted a breakpoint is highlighted. So now we can execute our code line by line. We have the same tools that we had in Chrome. We can step over the current line. We can step into it if you're calling a function that we have written. If you're inside a function, we can step out of it. We can restart our debugger and we can disconnect from our debugging session. So let's step over this line. And by the way, the shortcut is F10. Now here on the left side, we can see the value of various variables. So VS Code automatically detected the variables in scope. So here we have X, the value of X is one. We also have our watch window. So we can selectively watch various variables in case they're not detected over here. So we can type X and we can see the value of X. So now we can execute our code line by line and see what's going on. When we are done, we should always stop the debugging session because our JavaScript code is executed remotely inside VS Code. So we disconnect here. Then we go to our app, bring up the developer menu and stop remote debugging. Now we get this error, runtime is not ready for debugging. Don't worry about this, we just need to reload our app. And here you can find the shortcut for reloading. On Mac, it's Command and R. So now our app is running just like before and the debugging session is terminated. So far we have been serving our app from this address, localhost port 19002. And that means if we turn off our computer or if you stop Expo CLI, we won't be able to open our app with Expo Client. This is where publishing comes to the rescue. So we can publish our app to Expo and then our app is going to have a public and a permanent address that anyone can use to open it with Expo Client. Just like how we can publish NPM packages to NPM directory. We can publish our app to Expo and it will be visible to anyone in the world. This is much easier than going through app stores. If you have done any kind of app development before, you probably know that going through app stores is very tedious. There are so many steps that you have to follow. With Expo, we don't have to worry about it. We simply publish our app to Expo and anyone in the world can open our app and test it with Expo Client. Of course, this is purely for development and testing, not production. When we want to put our app to production, we have to go through app stores. That's a topic for the future. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to publish your app to Expo. Now, we can publish using Metro Bundler here. So we can click on publish or republish project. Alternatively, we can open a new terminal window and type expo publish. Either way, you have to get back to this terminal window because expo is going to ask you a few questions. Let me show you. So in this demo, I'm not going to run expo publish here. Instead, I'm going to use the publish command here. So click. Now expo is asking the name of our app. This is loaded from app.json. So if you look at app.json, you can see various settings about our app. Here's the name of our app. Here's a URL slug for it. This will be part of our app's URL on Expo. You will see it in a second. So back to Metro Bundler, we can optionally specify the GitHub source URL as well as a description. We can optimize our assets so they will be compressed and minified. By default, this is enabled. Now, the URL of our app is going to look like this, expo.io. At sign, after this, we're going to have our username, which we're going to create in this video. And then we have done with it. So this is our URL slug. Now let's click on Publish Project. So we get back to our terminal window in VS Code. This is where we are running Expo CLI. So Expo is asking, how would you like to authenticate? We can make a new Expo account or log in with an existing account. So let's create a new Expo account. We have to enter our email. So I'm going to go with programming with mosh at gmail.com. For my username, I'm going to type programming with mosh. Let's give it a password and confirm it. All right. Now Expo is building our iOS and JavaScript bundles. All right. Back to Metro Bundler. Our app is successfully published to this address. Let's click on it. So here's our app. Currently, our app doesn't have an icon. That is why we have this empty box. We'll come back and fix this in the future. Now here we have this QR code. 
So anyone can scan this code with their phone and open our app with Expo Client. As simple as that. We don't have to go through app stores. Now, our app currently doesn't have any descriptions. So let's go back to Metro Bundler. Click on Publish one more time. And this time, give our app a description. I'm going to say a marketplace for selling the stuff you don't need anymore. Now, let's publish it one more time. Now, back in VS Code, let's open app.json. Down the bottom, you can see our new description. So our app is republished. Let's open it one more time. And here's the updated description. Beautiful. Hey guys, Mosh here. I just wanted to let you know that this tutorial is the first two hours of my ultimate React Native course. The complete course is divided into two parts, basics and advanced topics, but each part being about five to six hours long. So the complete course is over 10 hours long. It includes all the source code we write in this course. Every section has a before and after source code, so you can easily code along with me. Plus you will get plenty of exercises and step-by-step -step solutions and a certificate of completion that you can add to your resume. If you're interested, I'll put the link down below. I'm offering a discount to the first 100 students. So if you're interested, enroll now before it's too late. Now let's continue to the next lesson. In this section, we're going to look at some of the core components and APIs in React Native. We'll be talking about view, text, image, button, touchables, alert, and so on. There are more components in React Native than we can cover in this section or in this course, but throughout the course, you're going to learn the ones that you will use most of the time. Now, if you're curious, you can find the complete list of these core components and APIs on React Native website. So head over to reactnative.dev, then go to API. Here on the left, you can see all the core components that we can use for building user interfaces. These components are cross-platform. So when we compile our app, they will be mapped to their native equivalent. So if we use a button here, on Android, this will look like a standard Android button, and on iOS, it will look like a standard iOS button. We can also customize the look and feel of these buttons using styles. You'll learn that in the next section. So here are all the cross-platform components. We also have a bunch of components specific to Android and iOS. And we also have a bunch of APIs. These APIs give us access to native functions. They're not UI widgets. For example, we can use keyboard to control the soft keyboard, or we can use style sheet to create a bunch of styles. Again, these APIs are cross-platform. We also have a bunch of APIs specific to Android and iOS. Again, we'll study most of the essential components and APIs, but we don't have time to look at every single component. So once you learn the foundations, you can learn the other components on your own. So next, we're gonna talk about views. So earlier I told you that in React Native, we don't have HTML elements like div, span, paragraph, and so on. So we have to build our UI using the built-in components in React Native. View is the most basic and fundamental component for building UIs. It's like a div. So it's a container component that we can use for grouping or laying out children. So this view we have over here has a bunch of styles. Now we'll talk about styles in detail in the next section, but for now, let me briefly explain what these styles are. So we have flex set to one. This means that this view is flexible and it will grow both horizontally and vertically to fill the free space. In this case, it grows and takes the entire screen. Now the background color of this view is white. Let's change this to Dodger blue. So here we can use named colors. We can also use RGB colors exactly the same way we specify colors in web applications. Now, save the changes. Look, this view is filling the entire space. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention to is this notch or the edge on the new iPhones. Sometimes you wanna make sure that this notch doesn't cover your content. For example, back to our styles, let's remove these two properties, align items and justify content. With these, we can put a component in the center of this view. That is the reason why our text appears in the middle of the screen. Now we'll talk about layouts and aligning components in the next section. 
For now, let's just remove these two properties. Save the changes. Now look, our text is over here. It's too small. Let me make the simulator bigger. Look, so part of the text is covered by the notch. This is where we can use a special type of view called safe area view. So on the top, we import safe area view from React Native. Now we can replace this view with safe area view. So with this view selected, press Command and D on Mac or Control and D on Windows. Now both views are selected. We have two carrots. This is called multi-cursor editing. So we can replace both of these at the same time. So type safe area view. Now press escape to cancel multi-cursor editing. Okay, save the changes. Take a look. Our text is no longer behind this notch. So safe area view adds a bit of padding on the top to make sure that our content is within the safe area. All right, so this is all about views for now. Next, we're gonna talk about the text component. The second most fundamental component in React Native is text, and we use it for displaying text. So here we cannot place text just anywhere within JSX, as we do in web applications. We should always wrap our text with the text component. Now, this text component has a few interesting props. Let's look at the documentation for this component. So here on React Native website, under the API section, let's look at the documentation for the text component. So here we have a bunch of props. I'm gonna talk about the most important ones. The first one is number of lines. When we set this, if our text is longer, it will get truncated. Let me show you. So back in VS Code, let's change this to a really, really long text. Now I wanna make this even longer and see what happens. So now our text is wrapped, we have two lines, but if we set the number of lines to one, our text will get truncated. Take a look. So we set the number of lines to one. Now save, take a look. So we have dot, dot, dot at the end of the first line. Very useful. We can also make this text act like a link using the unpress prop or event. So here we set unpress. We set this to a function. We can write a function in line here like this. We can pass an arrow function to a console.log saying text clicked. But this is useful for very small functions, one-liners. If you have a fair amount of logic, we don't want to throw all that logic here in the middle of our JSX. So we should implement it in a separate function. So before our return statement, we can define a function. By convention, we prefix the function name with handle. So we want to handle the unpress event. We call this function handle press. Now we set it to an arrow function. And this is where we do our console.log. Text pressed. Okay. Now we set unpress to handle press. Save the changes. Take a look. So I tap on this. Now, if you look at the terminal window, you see our log message. So we talked about the two essential props for the text component. Now, as you're building apps, get yourself used to reading this documentation for every component you come across. It helps you better understand the capabilities and limitations of that component. Next, we're gonna talk about images. Now let's talk about rendering images. First, let's restore our app to its original state. So let's change the background color to white. Now to put our content in the center of the screen, we have to set two properties. Justify content, we set this to center. And align items, we should set this to center as well. Okay, so now anything that we put inside this container, that is our safe area of view, will be in the center of the screen, like this, okay? Now to render an image, first we import the image component from React Native. With this component, we can display both local images that we bundle with our app, as well as network images that we download over the internet. So currently in our assets folder, we have two images, icon and splash, which is used when our app is loading. So let's display the icon right below the text. So here we type image, 
Now, because we're not going to put anything in between the image tags, we can use the self-closing syntax. That makes our code cleaner. Now, here we should set the source prop. To load our icon, we use the require function and specify the path to our image. So our app component is right here. We should go to the assets folder and load icon.png. So here we type period, which represents the current folder. Then we go to assets and load icon.png. So when we use the require function, React Native Packager will include this file in our bundle. So it's going to increase the size of our app. So we should use static images if they really have to be shipped with our app, like the icon or splash screen. Otherwise, we should download images from the internet. So now save the changes. Here's our image, beautiful. Now, what do you think this require function returns? It doesn't return an image or a string. It returns a number that is a reference to our image. Let me show you. So before our return statement, let's do a console.log and print require assets slash icon.png. Now, look in the terminal. So two is the reference to our image, okay? All right, now let's delete this line. So this is how we can render local or static images. But what about network images? Well, let's head over to pixum.photos. This is a random image generator. Here's an example. Look at this URL. Every time we hit this URL, we'll get a random image with these dimensions, 200 by 300. So let's copy this. Now, back to VS Code. For network images, instead of the require function, we have to pass an object here. Now, this object should have a property called URI, which we set to a string. And this is where we paste the URL that we copied. So save the changes. Back to our simulator. Our image is not visible because React Native doesn't know its dimensions. So we have to manually specify the dimensions for network images. For local images, we didn't have to do this because the require function reads the metadata about our images, okay? So back to our code. In the object that we passed to the source prop, we set two extra properties, width to 200 and height to 300. Save the changes. So here's our image component and here's the result, beautiful. Now here on the official documentation, you can see various props for the image component. Let's talk about a few useful props here. We have blur radius. This applies a blur effect to our image. So here we can set blur radius to, let's say 10. Now look, our image looks blurry. We also have loading indicator source. This is similar to the source prop. So we can give it a local image using the require function or we can pass the URI of a network image. The image we pass here will be displayed while the actual image is being downloaded. We have another prop called fade duration. As you can see in this table, it's only supported in Android. So Android loads this image with a fade effect and by default, this fade effect takes 300 milliseconds. Let me show you. Here's my Android virtual device. We can reload the app by pressing R twice. Now. Look at the fade effect. Did you see that? We can change its duration to make it more pronounced. So here we can set fade duration to, let's say one second. Now let's reload the app. And here's our fade effect, beautiful. So this only works on Android. It has no effect on iOS. Another useful prop is resize mode, which is used if the dimensions of our image is different from the dimensions we specify. So here we have various resize modes. We have cover, contain, stretch, repeat, and so on. These are the same resize modes we have in web applications. We also have a bunch of events like unload, unload end, unload start, and so on. With these, we can tap into certain moments when an image is being loaded. In the previous lesson, we added this image to our app. Now let's take this app to the next level and allow the user to tap on this image. With our text component, we achieve this by handling the unpress event, right? But the image component doesn't have this prop or event. This is where we can use touchable components. So we can make anything touchable. Here are the touchable components in React Native. We have touchable highlight, touchable opacity, 
touchable without feedback. The touchable component we use will depend on the kind of feedback we want to give to our users. Let me show you. So back to our code, let's import touchable without feedback. And note that I'm not typing the complete name of this component. I'm using shortcuts. So I'm typing a little bit of it like T-O-U-W-F and then press enter. This is much faster than typing the complete name of a component. Okay. Now to make this image touchable, we have to wrap it inside a touchable without feedback component. So once again, I'm going to use a shortcut to touchable without feedback, press enter. Now let's move this image inside touchable without feedback. So I'm holding alt and then pressing the up arrow. With this, we can move code like this. Okay. Now this touchable without feedback has an event called unpress. It also has an event called on long press. This is useful when we want to allow the user to tap and hold on a component. So here let's handle the unpress event. Here we can pass a function. Let's do a console.log and say image tapped. Now save the changes. So when I tap on this image, nothing happens because we're using touchable without feedback. It doesn't give us any visual feedback. But if you look at our terminal, we can see our message. Now let's replace this with a different kind of touchable. So on the top, let's import touchable opacity. Now let's replace this with touchable opacity. So touchable opacity, we should also replace this tag. Take a look. So when we tap on this image, its opacity gets reduced so we can see the background. This is why this touchable is called touchable opacity. For a fraction of a second, it reduces the opacity of what we are making touchable. Okay. Now let's look at touchable highlight. So we import it on the top, touchable highlight, and then use it over here. Now using command and D, as I told you before, we can select both instances and replace them in one go. Touchable highlight. Save the changes. Take a look. So when we tap on this image, its background gets darkened for a fraction of a second. This is the effect of touchable highlight. So these are the three cross-platform touchable components we have in React Native. We also have a touchable that is specific to Android. It's called touchable native feedback. It's not supported on iOS. So when we use it, we get a warning. Let me show you. So let's import touchable native feedback. Now, let's use it here. Touchable native feedback. Save the changes. On iOS, we get this red box. Touchable native feedback is not supported on this platform. So later in this section, I will show you how you can detect the platform in which this app is running. So if it's running on iOS, perhaps we can use touchable opacity. If it's running on Android, we can use touchable native feedback. Now let's try this touchable on an Android virtual device. So I'm going to bring up my Android virtual device. When I tap on this image, nothing happens because this touchable doesn't really work with images. It works with views that have a background color. Let me show you. So back to our code on the top, let's import the view component. Now we're going to replace this image with a view. Let's give this view a few styles. So we set the style prop to an object with a few properties with, let's say 200 height. I'm going to use 70 and background color. Let's set this to Dodger blue. Now save the changes. Take a look. This is the native feedback effect that we have on Android. So this is all about touchables. Next, we're going to talk about buttons. Now let's talk about the button component. So I've cleaned up the code here. We only have a safe area view, no text, no image, no touchable component here. We want to add a button to our view so we can import it on the top and then add it over here. But let me show you a shortcut. Here we can type button. Now here in the IntelliSense, look, we have auto import. So we can have VS Code automatically import this for us. So here we press enter and our button is imported here. Beautiful. 
Now with buttons, we can use the self-closing syntax because we don't put anything in between that. So here we set the title to, let's say, click me. And we handle the on press event. Pretty straightforward. Let's log button tapped. Now save the changes. So here's our button on an iPhone. And here's our button on an Android phone. So each platform has a different way of presenting this button component. Because as I told you before, this button component that we're using here gets mapped to its native equivalent. So on Android, buttons look like this by default. Now we can change the color of this button. For example, we can set the color to orange, save the changes. Now our button has an orange background and on iPhone, it has an orange text. We can also create a custom button that has a unique look and feel. I'll show you how to do that in the next section when we talk about styling. Next, we're gonna talk about alerts. Let's make this app more interesting. Instead of printing something on the console, let's display a standard alert box. So I'm gonna delete console.log and use the alert function. So the alert function that we have in browsers also works here. So here we can display a message like button tapped. Save. Now take a look. On iOS, we get the standard iOS alert box. And on Android, we get a different kind of alert. Again, this is because the alert we display gets mapped to its native equivalent. Now, when we use the alert function, we get a box. The title of this box is alert. And here we have a single button called OK. If this doesn't work for you, you can always customize it. You can change the title. You can change the buttons here. Let me show you. So on the top, we import alert. This is not a component that has a visual representation. This is an API. So it's an object with a couple of methods. Let me show you. So I'm going to put this on a new line. Now, instead of alert, we're going to type alert dot. Look, here we have two methods. Alert for displaying a message and prompt for asking a question and getting an answer. So let's use the alert method. This method has a few parameters. The first one is the title of our alert box. Let's set it to my title. The second parameter is our message. I'm gonna set this to my message. The third parameter is the array of buttons. So I'm gonna pass an array here. In this array, we add an object. Now press control and space. You can see the properties of this object. So every button can have a text, it can have a style, and it also raises the unpress event. So let's set the text of the first button to yes. Now we add a second button and set its text to no. Save the changes. So this is what we have. Now take a look. Now we have a custom alert. The title is changed. And we have two buttons here. Now, how do we know which button was clicked? That's very easy. We just have to handle the unpress event of these two buttons. So here we can say unpress. We can set this to a function. We can do a console.log of yes. And over here, we can set unpress to a different function. And here we can log a different message on the console. Take a look. Yes. Now, back in the terminal, here's our message, beautiful. Now let's look at the prompt method. So I'm gonna delete these few lines. Here we call alert.prompt. This method also takes a title. So here's the title of our box. We also give it a message. Now the third parameter is a callback or buttons. So we can pass a callback function that takes a parameter of type string. This is the text that the user enters into the box. So we can get that and print it on the console. Pretty straightforward. So save the changes. Now let's try it on iOS. So here we have this input box where we can type something. So let's say hello world. Now if we press OK, our callback function will get called. So we get our message in the console. Now, one thing you need to know is that this API only works in iOS at the time of recording this video. So on Android, when I tap on this button, nothing happens. Hopefully this will change in the future.
Another useful API you need to know about is the Stylesheet API. You have seen this before. With this, we can define styles. But let me clarify a few things about styles in a React Native app. First of all, as I said before, these styles we have here, they are not CSS. Their names are inspired by CSS, but they are not CSS. These are just regular JavaScript properties. So when we build our app, React Native will map these platform agnostic components to their native equivalent, and then it will apply these properties on them. Okay? So that means this object that we're passing here is essentially a plain JavaScript object. So instead of referencing this object, styles.container, we can pass an inline object here and set the background color to, let's say, orange. Now, look, we have this orange bar on the top because we're applying a single style. We're only setting the background color, okay? We can also define this object somewhere else. For example, I can cut this from here. Let's define a constant called container style and set it to this object. Now we can reference this object over here, container style. Our app still works. Now, previously we were using styles.container. Styles is the object that we're defining over here. So when we call stylesheet.create, we pass an object. This object that we pass here is the same object that we get as a result. So our styles object has a property called container, which is an object itself. This is the reason why we can reference styles.container over here. So whatever we pass to the create method, we get it as a result. Now you might ask, but what is the purpose of this method? Why can't we just use a plain JavaScript object? Why do we have to call stylesheet.create? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is that this method validates the properties that we use here. So it ensures that we don't accidentally misspell a property. So if we misspell this property, let's say we add an E at the end, look what happens. We get this red box. Background color with an E is not a valid style property. This validation doesn't happen if we use a plain JavaScript object directly. So let me revert this back. Now let's pass an inline object and set its background Let's misspell it to something else. Look, we don't get any errors, but our app doesn't have the right look either. So this is one benefit of using stylesheet.create. Let me remove this. So styles.container. So this method validates the properties that we pass here. The second benefit is that the React Native team have been working on implementing some kind of optimizations behind the scene. As far as I know, these optimizations are not available at the time of recording this, but they're coming in the future. So it's the recommended practice to use the Stylesheet API to define styles. So this is all about the Stylesheet API. Now, here we can also combine multiple style objects. So instead of passing a single object, we can pass an array of objects. So in this array, first we have styles.container, and then we can add a second object, like this object that we define over here. Now, take a look. The result is the combination of these two style objects, kind of similar to how we can apply multiple CSS classes to an HTML element. But here, the results are more predictable. So the object on the right overwrites the properties of the object on the left. In this case, container style is defining a single property, that's background color. So this is overwriting the background color that we defined earlier. So the results are more predictable. Now, another question you might have is, do we have to put these styles in the same file? Not really. You can extract this from here, put it in a separate file, and then import it in this file. That's totally fine. But it's very conventional to define the styles below a component because quite often you need to work with both the structure of your component as well as the styles in the same session. If you put the styles in a separate file, you have to constantly go back and forth between two files. I personally, even though I'm all about writing clean code and separation of concerns, I prefer to have the styles below my components. It has worked better for me, but if you don't like it, that's totally fine. You can separate your styles. In the next section, we're gonna talk about styles in detail. For now, that's all you need to know about styles. There are times we need to detect the platform in which our app is running and customize some styles or behaviors. 
Here's an example. Look at our styles object. Let's remove these two properties so our button is no longer at the center of the screen. Take a look. So it's here on the top, but look at our Android virtual device. Our button is below the status bar. So this safe area of view component that we used earlier, it only works for iOS. So it makes sure that our content is not covered by this notch on iPhone. It has no effect on Android at the time of recording this video. So in this case, we need to manually add some padding on the top to push this button down so it's no longer behind the status bar. This is where we use the platform module. So on the top, we import the platform module from React Native. Now, over here, we can add a third style, padding top. We want to set this dynamically. If the current platform is Android, we want to set this to, let's say, 20. Otherwise, we want to set it to zero. So here we type platform. Now, this object has a few properties. OS returns the operating system, which can be Android, iOS, and so on. We can also get the version of our platform. We can check to see if this is an iPad, if this is a TV, and so on. So let's read this property. We can compare this with, now here we press Control and Space. We can see various values that are accepted. So we have Android, iOS, Mac OS, Web, and Windows. So if this is Android, we want to set padding top to 20. Otherwise, we want to set it to zero. Save. Take a look. Now our button is below the status bar. But why 20? Well, this was just for a demo. The proper way to do this is to calculate the height of the status bar and use that as the value for this style. So on the top, we're going to import the status bar API. Now, we're going to replace 20 with status bar dot current height. This is the proper way to add padding on the top because the height of the status bar might be different from one Android phone to another. So save the changes. Now, our button is just below the status bar. Hey guys, Mosh here. I just wanted to let you know that this tutorial is the first two hours of my ultimate React Native course. The complete course is divided into two parts, basics and advanced topics, but each part being about five to six hours long. So the complete course is over 10 hours long. It includes all the source code we write in this course. Every section has a before and after source code, so you can easily code along with me. Plus, you will get plenty of exercises and step-by-step -step solutions and a certificate of completion that you can add to your resume. If you're interested, I'll put the link down below. I'm offering a discount to the first 100 students. So if you're interested, enroll now before it's too late. Now let's continue to the next lesson. In this section, you're going to learn how to create layouts in React Native. And this is where the fun begins because we're going to build the first two screens of our app. So we're going to talk about dimensions, device orientation, flexbox, as well as absolute and relative positioning. So pay close attention to the lessons and take notes because you're going to use these materials as part of the exercises at the end of the section. So I'm super excited about this section. I hope you are too. Now let's jump in and get started. Let's talk about the dimensions of components on the screen. So let's import the view component from React Native. Now, in our safe area view, let's add a view. We give it a style. Let's set the background color to Dodger Blue. I'm going to give this a width of 150 and a height of 70. Now, these numbers we have here are density independent pixels or dips. The actual size equals density independent pixels times scale factor of the device. For example, iPhone 4 can display 320 by 480 points. These points are abstract units. They're not pixels. Now, the scale factor of iPhone 4 is 2 or 2x. That means every point contains two pixels. So the screen resolution of iPhone 4 equals 640 by 960 pixels. Now, if the width of our view is 150 density independent pixels or dips, its actual width on an iPhone 4 will equal 150 times 2, 
which is 300 pixels. That is roughly around half of the screen width, right? Now, in contrast, iPhone 11 Pro Max can display 414 by 896 points. With a scale factor of three, here's the screen resolution of iPhone 11 Pro Max. Now, what is the width of our view on this iPhone? It is 150 times three equals 450 pixels. So again, it's roughly around half of the screen width, roughly, not exactly. In fact, our view looks a little bit smaller on an iPhone 11 Pro Max. Now, don't worry about memorizing any of these numbers. They don't matter. What matters is that by expressing the size of our components in density independent pixels, we can feel relaxed that they look almost the same size across different devices. Now, if you wanna make sure that this width is exactly half of the screen width, we can use a percentage value here. So we replace 150 by 50%. Make sure to put this in quotes because this is a string value. Now, save. So here's our view. It's taken exactly half of the screen. Now, in some situations, you want to fine tune the size of a component according to the size of the screen. In those cases, we can use the dimensions API. So on the top, we import dimensions from React Native. Now, let's log dimensions.get. Here we should pass a string that can be either window or screen. Screen returns the size of the entire screen, whereas window returns the size of the visible application window. On iOS, these dimensions are equal. They're only different on Android. So the window size is a bit smaller than the screen size. So I'm gonna pass screen here. Now save. Look at the terminal. So here you can see the width and the height of this iPhone, as well as its scale factor. So every point on this iPhone has three pixels. So this is how we can get the dimensions of the device using the Dimensions API. Now, the problem with this API is that it doesn't respond to orientation changes. So if the user rotates the device, these numbers don't get updated. We'll talk about how to handle that in the next lesson. There are times we want to detect our screen orientation and resize our components accordingly. For example, let's set the width of this view to 100% and its height to 30%. So imagine this is a video player. In portrait mode, you want to have this video player on top. And in landscape mode, we want to have this take the entire screen. Right now, the height of this imaginary video player is always 30% of the height of the screen. This is where we need to detect the orientation of our screen and resize this component accordingly. And by the way, to rotate this iOS simulator, we hold down the command key and use the left or right arrows like this, okay? And for Android, we have this toolbar. Now look at the shortcut. On Mac, it's Command and Left. On Windows, it's probably Control and Left. I'm not entirely sure. So to support different orientations, first we go to app.json. By default, the orientation of our app is set to Portrait, so it only supports the Portrait mode. We can set this to Landscape to only support the Landscape mode, but this is not very common. We can also set this to default to support both modes. So let's save the changes. Now, to detect screen orientation, we're gonna use this library called Hooks Developed by React Native Community. So on this page, you can see we have various hooks. Hooks are functions that bring extra capabilities to function components. For example, we can add state to a function component using one of the built-in hooks in React. If you're not familiar with hooks, I highly encourage you to watch the last section of my React course. I covered hooks in detail in that section. So here we have various hooks or various functions. All these hooks by convention start with use. For example, we have use back handler to work with the back button on Android. We have used camera roll. We have used dimensions, use device orientation and so on. So first let's install this library. Here in the terminal we install at react dash native dash community slash hooks. All right, this is installed. Now let's go back to app.js. First, we should import use dimensions from at react native community slash hooks. With this hook, we can get the correct dimensions of the screen 
whether we are in portrait mode or in the landscape mode. This hook always returns the updated dimensions. This is one of the limitations of the Dimensions API in React Native. So this is the preferred way to get the dimensions of the screen if you support multiple orientations. So let's do a console.log statement and call use dimensions. Save now. Here you can see the width of our screen is 414. Now, if I rotate this device, in the landscape mode, we get this new width, 896. So every time we rotate our device, our component gets recalled, and here we recalculate the updated dimensions. Now, we also have another hook for detecting the screen orientation, use device orientation. So let's call it here. So let's reload the app in portrait mode. Okay, so we get an object. This object has two properties. Landscape is false and portrait is true. Now if I rotate the simulator, we get a new object. Now landscape is true and portrait is false. So to make this imaginary video player, take the entire screen in landscape mode, we can write code like this. First, we call this function. Then we'll store the result in this object. Or we can use object destructuring here and pick the landscape property from that object. Now, we can calculate the height dynamically. So if you're in the landscape mode, we're going to set the height to 100%. Otherwise, we're going to set it to 30%. Take a look. So. Let's reload the app. All right. In landscape mode, our video player is taking the entire screen. We have these white edges. This is because we put this inside of a safe area of view. Perhaps for a video player, this is not something we want to do. We want to make sure that the video player takes the entire screen. But let's not worry about it in this lesson. Now, if we rotate this to right, the height of our video player will be 30% of our screen height. So using the hooks in this library, we can get the dimensions and the orientation of our device. Now for the app that we're going to build in this course, we're not going to support the landscape mode. So I'm going to go back to app.json and set the orientation back to portrait. Now let's talk about Flex or Flexbox. With Flex, we can easily build complex layouts that work consistently across different screen sizes. We have the same concept in CSS, but Flexbox in React Native is a little bit different. So make sure to watch the next few lessons, even if you're familiar with Flexbox in CSS. So I've removed all the code we have written so far. We're only importing the view component from React Native. Now in our app component, let's return a view and give this view a couple of styles. So I'm going to set the background color to Dodger blue and flex to one. When we set flex to one, this view grows to take the available free space. So save. Now our view is taking the entire screen. What if we set flex to 0 0.5? Now our view takes half of the screen. Okay. So with flex, we typically set up a view as a container and then align children inside that container. So let's imagine this view is our container. So let's change its background color to white and set flex to one. So it takes the entire screen. Now inside this view, we're going to add another view. Here we can use the self-closing syntax because we're not going to put anything inside this view. Now let's give this view a couple of styles. So I'm going to set the background color to Dodger blue and flex to one. Let's see what we get. Once again, we get a blue screen because our parent or container view is taking the entire screen. And inside this container, we have this other view, the blue view, which is growing to take the available free space. So it fills its container. That is why the entire screen looks blue. Now, with this view selected, let's hold down Shift and Alt and then press the down arrow. With this, we can duplicate code in VS Code. So let's duplicate this one more time. Now we have three views. The first view is Dodger Blue. The second view, let's make it gold. 
and the third view, let's make it tomato. That's a kind of red. So this is what we get. So now our screen is divided into three segments. Each view is taking a third of its container or a third of the screen. Now, what if we set the flex property of this blue view to two? Now the blue view is twice as big as the other views. With this setup, we're essentially dividing the space into four segments. Why four? Well, we have two plus one plus one. So we have four segments. Two out of four segments is allocated to the first view, to the blue view. So this view is taking half of the screen or half of its container. And these other views, each is taking one fourth of the screen. So this is the basics of flex. Over the next few lessons, we're going to study other properties of flex. Now let's give these views a fixed size. So in this blue view, I'm going to remove the flex property. Let's set the width to 100 and height to 100 as well. Now we're going to repeat. So let's change the second view and the third view. Here's what we get. Our views are laid out vertically in a column because that makes more sense in mobile apps. Typically, we hold our phones in portrait mode, so that's why, by default, React Native vertically aligns the items in a container. If you have worked with Flexbox in CSS, you probably know that, by default, items are laid out horizontally. So this is one of the differences we have in React Native. Now, to lay this out horizontally, we go to our container. So here's our container. We set the Flex Direction property to Row. Here's what we get. We also have row reverse. So items are laid out from right to left. And we also have column reverse. So here's what we get. Now, anytime, if you wonder what values are acceptable here, simply delete this, press Control and Space. So here are the list of values. Column, which is the default value, column reverse, row, and row reverse. Now let's set this back to row. With this setup, we say our main or primary axis is the horizontal axis, and the cross axis is the vertical axis. This is an important property of flex. We're going to get back to it over and over. Next, we're going to talk about aligning items. In this lesson, we're going to talk about aligning items in a container. So currently, our items or our views are appearing at the top left corner of the screen. What if you want to push this to the right or put them in the center of the screen? We go to our container and set the justify content property to one of these values. So let's set it to center. Here's what we get. So with this property, we can align items along the main or the primary axis. What is our main axis here? It's the horizontal axis because earlier, we set flex direction to row. So now our main axis is the horizontal axis. Now, what if we change this to column? Now our items are appearing at the center of the vertical axis because the vertical axis is now our primary or main axis. Let's change this back to row and look at the other values. So we have flex end. Now our items are appearing at the end of the horizontal axis. We also have Flex start, which is the default value. And we have three properties for distributing space. We have space around. So with this property, the space between each two items is equal. So look at the space here, it's equal. But the space around the first and last item and the edges of the screen is different. So here we have less space. If we change this to space evenly, now the space is evenly distributed between items. And we also have space between. With this setup, the first and the last items are pushed to the edges of the screen, and the remaining space is distributed between the other items. So let's change this back to center. Now we have another property called align items. And with this, we can align items across the secondary axis. So what is our secondary axis here? 
is the vertical axis, right? So if we set this to center, now our items appear at the center of the screen. Let's look at the other values. You have baseline. We cannot see the impact of this unless we change the height of one of these views. So let's change the height of the first view to 300 and the second view to 200. Now these views have the same baseline, okay? Let's look at another value, flex end. This is pretty self-explanatory. So our items appear at the end of the secondary axis, okay? What else do we have here? Flex start. Now the items appear at the start of the vertical axis. And finally, we have stretch, which is the default value. Now we don't see the impact of this property unless we remove the height of one of these views. So I'm going to comment this out. See what happened? The blue view stretched to fill the entire vertical axis. So this is the default value. If we comment out align items, we get the exact same result. So let's bring it back and change it to center and bring back the height property as well. So with justify content, we align items across the main axis and with align items, we align them across the secondary axis. Now, the first time I learned about these properties, I was a bit confused. I was wondering why the names are not consistent. Every time I wanted to align something, I wasn't sure which property I had to use. Honestly, it's a bit weird, I know, but you will get used to it. As we go through the course, you're going to use these properties over and over. So that will be second nature to you. Now, what if you want to change the alignment of one of these items? Let's say we want to put the blue view over here. So we go to this view and set align self to flex start. So look at these two properties. We have align items, which we apply to the container, and we have align self, which we apply to an individual item. Now, here's what we get. So this is all about aligning. Next, we're going to talk about wrapping items. Let's talk about wrapping items. So I'm going to go to the last view, this view over here. Let's duplicate this and change the background color of the new view to gray. So here's our new view. And we have a bit of extra space here. So what do you think will happen if we add an extra view here? Let's find out. So let's duplicate this one more time and change the background color of the new view to green, yellow. Do you see what happened? The blue view got shrunk, so the green view can fit on the screen. So this is the default behavior. If our items overflow across the main axis, one or more items get shrunk, so other items can fit on the screen. We can change this behavior by enabling wrapping. So we go to our container. Here's our container. We apply a new style called flex wrap. The default value is no wrap. We set this to wrap, but when I save the changes, the alignment of these items is going to get screwed. Take a look. See what happened? So we have wrapping because the green view is appearing on the second line and the blue view is no longer shrunk. But what happened to our vertical alignment? We wanted all these items to be vertically in the center of the screen. This is where a lot of people get confused. So let me clarify it for you. When we enable wrapping, the align items property behaves a bit differently. So if you have multiple lines, the align items property determines the alignment of items within each line. Let me show you with a good example. So I'm going to change the height of the first view, the blue view to 300. See what's happening? Within each line, our items are vertically centered. Now currently, we have a single item on the second line, but if you had multiple items with different heights, all these items would also be vertically centered. So align items property determines the alignment of items along the secondary axis within each line. Now, if you want to put all these items together in the center of the screen or in the center of the vertical axis, we use a different property. It's called align content. So we want to align the entire content as a whole. We set this to center. Now, 
all these items are appearing in the center of the vertical or the secondary axis. So this is the difference between align items and align content. Align items determines the alignment of items within each line, and align content determines the alignment of the entire content. Now, align content only works if we have wrapping. If we don't have wrapping, it has no effect. So this is all about wrapping. So we have covered all the essential properties of Flex, but there are three other properties that you need to understand. You may not use them as much, but it's good to know them in case you see them in someone else's code. So here's our blue view. Here we can apply a property called Flex Bases. And with this, we can set the size of an item along the primary axis. So our primary axis here is the horizontal axis. So if we set this property to 100, this is equivalent to setting the width to 100. So if I comment out this property and save the changes, look, we get the same result. Now if our primary axis was the vertical axis, setting flex basis would be equivalent to setting the height property. So flex basis can map to width or height. Now we have another property, flex grow. If we set this to one, the moment I save the changes, you will see the blue view grow to fill the available space. Take a look. Here it is. In fact, setting flex grow is exactly the same as setting the flex property. Now, if I save the changes, we are not going to see the same result because I don't know if there is a problem with the simulator or the tooling. So let's verify this save. Look, we don't get the same result, but if we manually refresh using the developer menu, we see the same result as applying the flex grow property. Okay. Now we have another property called flex shrink. Honestly, it's not something used that often, but let me explain how it works. It's essentially the opposite of flex grow. So to simplify things, let's get rid of these two properties and set the width to 400. Now our blue view is taking so much space. So the orange view is not fitting on the screen. We have overflowing. In this case, we can set flex shrink to one. And with this, we are saying that, hey, if you have overflowing, this item can get shrunk so other items can fit on the screen. Take a look. Save. There you go. I told you that flex is a shorthand for flex grow and flex shrink. So if we set flex to a negative number, this is exactly the same as setting flex shrink. I save the changes we don't get the same result because there is a problem going on here. So we have to manually refresh. Now we get the same result as setting the flex shrink property. So this is all about flex bases, flex grow and flex shrink. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about absolute and relative positioning in React Native. So we have our container with three items in it, just like before. Now, what if you wanna move this gold view without changing the layout around it. It's very easy. So here's our gold view. We can set top to 20. Now, when I save the changes, this gold view will move 20 independent pixels from the top. Look, here it is. We can also set a negative value. So our gold view moved negative 20 pixels from the top. This is exactly the same as setting the bottom property. So if I set bottom to 20, that means you want to move this gold view 20 pixels from the bottom. We also have left and right. So let's move this 20 pixels from the left or 20 pixels from the right. So with these properties, we can position a component relative to its current position without affecting the layout around it. So in all these examples, the blue and the red views have been exactly where they're supposed to be. They didn't move around, right? This happens because in React Native, all components by default have their position set to relative. So this is how relative positioning works in CSS as well. In contrast to relative positioning, we have absolute positioning. Now, if I save the changes, this gold view will be positioned relative to its parent, which is this container that takes the entire screen. And these other views will move around as a result of this positioning. Let me show you. Before I save the changes, let's set top to 20 and left to 20 as well. So we can see clearly. 
So save, look, our gold view is positioned 20 pixels from the left and top of its parent. That's the container that takes the entire screen. And as a result of this positioning, these other views moved around, so they're not in their original position. Let me show you one more time. So I'm gonna change position back to relative. Look, with relative positioning, these two views did not move. They stayed in their original position. If we use absolute positioning for this gold view, it will be positioned relative to its parent, and these other views will be repositioned. Look, they moved around, okay? So to recap, in React Native, all components by default have their position set to relative, which means we can move them relative to their current position without changing the layout around them. If we change the position to absolute, we can move a component relative to its parent and the layout around it will get affected. This is all about absolute and relative positioning in React Native. All right, now it's time for an exercise. So I want you to implement two screens of our app, the welcome screen and the view image screen. For the welcome screen, we have this logo and this background image. You can download these below this video. Now in this section, our focus is purely on laying out components on the screen. So we're not concerned about styling. For example, our text here, it's very small and it's close to the logo. We don't wanna worry about these details. We're gonna talk about styling in the next section. So then we're gonna come back and fix those problems. Now these red and green boxes, they are placeholders for the login and register buttons that we're gonna create in the next section. Now for the view image screen, again, we have two placeholders for the close and delete icons that we're gonna add in the next section. So go ahead and implement these two screens. This is gonna take about 15 minutes of your time. Once you're done, come back see my solution. All right, the first thing I wanna do is to create a new folder here in the root called app. I'm gonna put all of our application source code inside this folder. This is a good practice to follow because with this, we can separate our application code from the code that is automatically generated by our tooling. Let's say tomorrow something crazy happens with this project. We can create a brand new React Native project and simply copy our application code into that project, okay? So here's our app folder. Let's move the assets folder inside this folder. Now we need to go to app.json and update the path to these two images. So app slash assets, and one more time, save. Let's make sure that everything is working properly. Good. So in our app folder, let's add a new folder called screens. I like to add all our screen components inside this folder. This is a convention that a lot of React Native developers follow. You don't have to follow it if you don't like it. So in the screens folder, let's add a new file called welcome screen. Look at the naming convention I'm using to name this file. So for these components, I like to use the word screen in the file and the components name. Now, here we wanna implement a function component. Earlier in the course, I told you to install this extension, React Native, React Redux Snippets. With this extension, we can quickly type code. So throughout the course, I'm gonna use the shortcuts that come with this extension. You can always learn about this shortcut down below or on the GitHub page of this project, okay? So here's an example. We type RSF, that is short for React Stateless Function. Now we have the basic template for a function component with multi-cursor editing enabled. So here we can rename this component if you want to. Once we're done, we press the escape button to disable multi-cursor editing. Now, first we wanna add an image background component here. So let's delete the div element. We type image background. Here we have auto import, so let's import this. Now we need to set the source of this image. So source equals, here we call the require function. Now currently we are in the screens folder. So let's go one level up. Now we go to assets and load background.jpg, okay? Save the changes. Now we should give this component a style. So after this component, I'm gonna type RNSS, that is short for React Native Style Sheet. So this quickly generates this code, stylesheet.create. We store the result in this object, styles, and 
Unfortunately, this is not imported on the top, so we have to manually import it, style sheet, okay? So in this object, we're gonna have a bunch of key value pairs. So let's add a new key value pair called background. This is where we're gonna add all the styles for our image background component. So I'm gonna set flex to one. So this image background takes the entire screen, okay? Now, here we set our style to styles that background. Save. Let's go to our app component and render our welcome screen. So I'm gonna delete all the code here. We don't need it anymore. So we type welcome screen and have VS code automatically imported on the top. Beautiful. Let's see what we get. So here's our background image. Now let's add our buttons. So over here, inside this component, we're gonna add a view. Let's give it a style. So we're gonna set this to styles.login button. Now let's create that over here. So as you see, I'm not writing inline styles anymore. I like to separate these. So login button. Let's set its width to 100% and its height to 70 pixels. The background color should be. Now let me look at my cheat sheet. So that's gonna be FC5C65. Save the changes. We can find variable view because we didn't import it on the top. So let's add it to this list. Save. So our button is currently on the top. We wanna to put it down below over here. How do we do that? Well, earlier we talked about flex direction. So by default, flex direction is set to column. So our primary axis is this vertical line. Now I told you that using justify content, we can align items along the primary axis. So we go to the styles for our container, which is this background image. Here we set justify content to flex end. The default value is flex start. That is the reason why our button appears here on the top. So we set this to flex end, save the changes. Now our button is here, beautiful. Let's duplicate this to add the second button. I'm gonna rename this to register button. Now let's duplicate these styles and rename this to register button. I'm gonna use the same width and height but change the background color to 4ECDC4. Now you might be thinking I'm typing too fast, but at this point you should have already done your exercise. You shouldn't code along with me. So I don't wanna waste a lot of people's time by typing really slowly, okay? So save the changes. Here's our second button, beautiful. Now we need to add the logo on the top, but here's a problem. If we add the logo, because we set justify content to flex end, our logo is gonna end up here. So how do we put it on the top? This is where we can use absolute positioning. So we can position the logo relative to its parent, which is this background image. So let's add an image here, image. Now let me show you something. In this case, auto import didn't work because I selected this item with this blue icon. So if you look on the right side, we don't have auto import. Sometimes this happens in the context menu that appears here. So look, we have two image instances. The second one with the orange icon has auto import. So make sure to select that one. So now you can see images imported on the top. So here I'm using the self-closing syntax because we're not gonna put anything inside this image. Now let's set its source. Once again, we use the require function. We go to the assets folder and load logo-red.png. Let's test the result up to this point. Our logo is way too big, so let's give it a couple of styles. We set style to styles.logo. Now, over here, and by the way, note that I'm sorting these keys, so we have background, login button, logo, and so on. This makes it easier to maintain your applications. So let's set the size of this logo to 100 by 100. So width is 100 and height is 100 as well. Save. 
Okay, this is good. Our logo is down below. Now we should use absolute positioning. So I'm going to set position to absolute. And let's put this 50 pixels from the top of the screen. So here's what we get. We can push it down a little bit. Let's say 70. That is better. But how do we put it in the center? Well, earlier we talked about the primary and the secondary axis in flex. So our primary axis is the vertical line and the secondary axis is the horizontal line. Using what property can we align items along the secondary axis? Using align items. So we go to our container over here. We set align items to center. And with this, we can align items along the secondary axis. Take a look. Now the image is right in the middle of the screen. Beautiful. So finally, we need to add our tagline below this logo. So let's add a text component. So we have this orange icon here, so we can automatically import this. What was our tagline? Sell what you don't need. Save. Our text appears here. So what we need to do is to put the text and the logo inside a container and apply absolute positioning on that container, okay? So let's add a new view here. Then we're gonna move the image and text components inside this view. So with this line selected, I'm gonna hold down the Alt key and then press the up arrow. With this, we can move code, okay? So now let's apply a style here. We can say styles.logo container, whatever you wanna call it. Now let's create this. So here's logo. Now we create logo container. This is very simple. I just want to move these two properties inside this object. Let's see what happens. So our text is in the right position, but our logo is not exactly in the middle of the screen. This happened because once we added this new container, the alignment of this container is reset to flex start by default. So in this container, once again, we need to set align items to center. So we can align the items along the secondary or the horizontal axis. Take a look. And here's the final result. In the next section, we're gonna apply a bunch of styles to make this screen pretty. Now, if you want my source code, you can get it from the zip file that I gave you at the beginning of the course in the first section. That zip file contains all the source code that we're gonna write throughout this course. So every section has a start and a finish folder where you can find the relevant source code. All right, now in the screens folder, let's add a new file called viewImageScreen.js. Here we're gonna create a function component. I'm happy with the name. Now in this component, first we wanna add an image. So image. Let's set its source to require. We go to the assets folder and load chair.jpg. Now, let's test our application up to this point. So we go to app.js and render view image screen. Okay, let's see what we get. So we get this kind of whitish screen because this image that I have supplied is very big and it doesn't fit on the screen. So we need to apply a bunch of styles here. We set style to, first we should create a styles object. So we type RNSS, good. Now let's import style sheet on the top. So in this object, we're gonna define a bunch of styles for our image. I'm gonna set the width to 100% and the height to 100% as well. And finally, let's set style to styles.image. Let's see what we get. So here's our image, but if you pay close attention, the sides of the image are cut off. Let me show you. So here in the project, let's take a look at this chair.jpg. Do you see the sides of this basket is cut off here? This is because of the resize mode. So to solve this problem, we go to our image and set the resize mode to contain. 
Now, our image perfectly fits on the screen. But we have this white background, so we have to change it. So let's wrap this inside a view that's going to be our container. So view, let's import it. Now we give it a bunch of styles. So style equals styles, the container. Now let's define the styles. So container. Once again, I'm trying to sort these alphabetically. This makes it easier to maintain our application. Also, if you use ESLint, ESLint automatically does this for you. But in this course, I'm not using ESLint because it keeps complaining and it creates a bad experience for you. So I have to manually sort these. So this container, we're going to set its background color to black. And I also like to set flex to one to make sure that this view takes the entire screen. So here's what we get. Beautiful. Now let's add the placeholders for the close and delete buttons. So back to our container, let's add another view, give it a style. Let's say a styles.close icon. Now we define the styles. Close icon comes before container. So let's set its width to 50, the height 50 as well. I'm going to set the background color to FC 5C 65. Now, if we save the changes, our button appears here. To solve this problem, we're going to use absolute positioning. We want to put this exactly right here. So we set position to absolute. So now we can position this component relative to its parent, which is the container. So let's say we want to position this. 40 pixels from the top and 30 pixels from the left. So it appears here. I'm happy with this, so let's move on. Now let's add our second placeholder. So I'm going to select this, hold down Shift, Alt, and Down to duplicate this code. Now let's rename this to Delete Icon. And then we define the styles, Delete Icon. Now to save time, I'm going to copy these few styles. I know copying code is bad, but we're going to fix this in the future. So for now, don't worry about it. So let's change the background color to 4E CD C4. Now we want this to be 30 pixels from the right of the screen. Take a look. Here's what we get. So I'm happy for now. As we go through the course, we're going to improve our code. We're going to refactor it. We're going to make it more professional. All right, one problem I see in our current implementation is the duplication of these color codes. We have repeated this in a few places. So what we can do now is to extract these color codes, put them in a separate file like colors.js, and with this, we have all the colors that our application uses in a single place. So if tomorrow we decide to rebrand this app and use different colors, there's a single file we have to modify. So in our project, inside the app folder, let's add a new folder called config. Here we add a new file called colors.js. Now in this file, I'm going to export a default object with these properties. We can define our primary color. So we're going to set this to FC 5C 65 and our secondary color to 4E CD C4. Now save the changes. We go back to our view image screen on the top. We import colors from config slash colors. And note that I'm separating the import statement from my code from the import statement from our third party libraries. Again, this is a convention that a lot of people follow to make their code clean and maintainable. So we imported colors. This is an object that we exported over here. Okay. So we can replace these hard coded values with colors dot primary and colors dot secondary. Save the changes. So take a look. We get the same result as before, but our application code is more maintainable now. We have a single place where we can define our color palette. Now, some people argue that even black or white should not be hard coded. They should be part of the palette. So 
in our color palette, we can define a new property, black, and set it to 000. zero, zero. Because tomorrow, if we decide to rebrand this app, we might use a different dark color rather than pure black. So it's a good practice to include it here. So save. Now we can replace this hard-coded value with colors that black. That's good. Now, we have another problem here, the duplication of these properties. So both our icons, these icons over here, have the width and height of 50. So you might be wondering if we can define these properties in a single place and reuse them in two places. We certainly can, but we're going to get rid of this view in the future. We're going to use a real icon. So for now, I'm not too worried about this. This is just a temporary solution. Hey guys, Mosh here. So as I told you before, this tutorial is the first two hours of my ultimate React Native course. The complete course is divided into two parts, basics and advanced topics, with each part being about five to six hours long. So the complete course is over 10 hours long. It includes all the source code we write in this course. Every section has a before and after source code, so you can easily code along with me. Plus, you will get plenty of exercises and step-by-step -step solutions and a certificate of completion that you can add to your resume. If you're interested, I've put the link down below. I'm offering a discount to the first 100 students. So if you're interested, enroll now before it's too late. Thank you, and I hope to see you in the course.